The story of Shirley Caesar began 80 years ago in Durham, North Carolina, in a house she shared with her mom, dad, and 11 siblings. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, look at this. From the time that I was a little girl born right here in this house, where I learned to walk, I learned to talk. I got my whippings in this house, too. Um, and I deserved everyone. I'm standing in the place where I was born. Isn't that a blessing? Oh, wow. Her father was a gospel singer himself. He was a noted gospel singer uh, throughout the Carolinas, and particularly in his hometown. Everybody knew him as Big Jim Caesar. So, of course, with that always being sung around the home, it just kind of spilled over to his children. I remember my sister Anne and I, we would wash the dishes and sing. The windows would be open. And after a while, the people in the community, they'd come by, listen to us. On summer nights, the Caesar family would be on their front porch. They would sing and practice songs, and you could hear them all the way down the end of the block. Most of the Caesars was very talented. Uh, they could sing, they could do about anything with musical instruments and, and all that sort of thing. She was very mischievous as a child. She loved to throw rocks and break out street lights. And of course, the next door neighbor saw it, sent her home, and by the time she got home, the news had already arrived there. When my daddy came in, mama told him what I'd done. He just picked me up right there feet dangling, arms dangling, carried me in the room and gave me a good whipping. After that whipping, somewhere around 2 o'clock in the morning, he suffered, it was a stroke, and he died. She was seven years old. For years, I somewhat blamed myself because I said, well, maybe if I had not thrown the rock to break that light out, that maybe he would have lived. It caused a lot of hardship losing the father because he was the breadwinner. You know, he was uh, the, the provider. My mother was a semi-invalid, so she couldn't hold down a job. She sold candy right there in the house and things like that uh, to meet the needs of the family. Everybody had to pitch in. Everybody had their own way of contribution, per se. And lo and behold, the Lord anointed me to sing. A year later, Shirley began opening for her brother Leroy's vocal quartet. When the people in the church heard this big voice coming from this little girl, they were just mesmerized, and it just her notoriety went out. She started singing, and a disc jockey came to Winston-Salem from New Orleans named Leroy Junction, and she was going by baby Shirley Caesar and she had talent. They would raise me an after offering. Sometimes the offering would be $100, $200, $300, and I gave it to my mama. I took every coin home. By the age of 12, Shirley's singing ministry had become a full-time job. Sometimes she would sing as many concerts as three times a day on a Sunday and then coming in wee hours of the morning on Monday morning and then have to go to school. I wish many times that I could live my childhood days over because I felt that I grew up too fast. But when I would sing, I would begin to feel that nudge on my heart. From that moment on, I started running for Jesus. Graduating high school in 1955, Shirley enrolled in North Carolina College to study business. But one night, while attending a star-studded gospel concert, everything changed. The caravans, the soulsters, the blind boys, they would sing, sing, sing. But what happened was the caravans only had three singers, Sarah McKissick, Inez Andrews, and Albertina Walker. If you're going to have three voices, then who's going to sing the lead? 
I said, I believe that I can sing that missing part. She wrote a note and sent the note up on stage to Albertina and said, there's a girl in the audience who can sing. You need to call her on stage. Somebody who was in charge of the service that night said, we got a request here for a Shirley Caesar to say, I said, that's me. Ran up on the stage. And I said, I'm going to sing, the Lord will make a way somehow. And when she finished singing that song, Albertina Walker said, I want that little girl. My motto has always been, Lord, if you just crack the door, I'll kick it down for your glory. And that was on a Sunday evening. On Monday, I sold my biology book. Caught a bus, met them in Washington, D.C. The rest is history. Everybody knew that the caravans was the number one female group in the country. And she brought that energy in. She brought a different taste, a different feel, a different spirit to the group. By 1958, 20-year-old Shirley Caesar was enjoying national success as the newest and youngest member of the caravans. It was wonderful because here I am among these powerful women who could make runs and do riffs with their voices. I was just in awe to be a part of such a group. The caravans paved the way for a lot of female gospel groups. They're uh, iconic. Then in 1963, Hob Records asked Shirley to record an album without the caravans. So I went to Albertina and said, Tina, they offered me $2,000 to sign. I'd never seen that much money in my life. And I figured that if you would sanction it, if they called me to sing uh, and the caravans come, you know, we would have like two incomes. Albertina Walker basically told her no. But it wasn't a, a selfish thought. Albertina had the welfare of the group to be responsible for. Albertina was looking at the fact that the caravan would go down if Shirley left because people expect Shirley to come out when the caravans are called on. Shirley didn't take the offer and remained with the caravans. But three years later, the label circled back with another solo deal. This time, Shirley said yes. It was very clear early on, you knew she was gonna be the Beyonce. It's not that she was better than, there's just a charisma that cannot be confined to a group. Shirley left the caravans and formed her own group called the Caesar Singers. Put your hand up. And in 1970, her live version of the gospel pop song, Put Your Hand in the Hand, put Shirley on center stage. I knew that it was not like a gospel gospel song, but I knew that the man that stole the waters had to be gone. She's able to take any type of music and transform it in a message that is meaningful and that is spiritual. Wow, those lyrics are so powerful to me. Put my hand in the hand of the man who steal the water. Yes, I want to do that. Put Your Hand in the Hand won Shirley a Grammy Award in 1971. Oh, my very first Grammy. Oh, my Grammy. It was exciting. Mahalia Jackson was like a spiritual singer, and I was a traditional gospel singer. And so I was the first female black gospel singer to receive the Grammy. People just, oh, they went crazy because, yes, a black woman had won a Grammy. And just as she'd done as a little girl, 
Shirley shared that success with her mother. The Lord spoke to my spirit. I looked at that big old house. I said, I'm gonna buy this house for my mama. I got up the next morning and found out who owned the house. And the Lord blessed me to buy that house for my mother. Sometimes people get blessed and they go, they take off east or west. They forget about the bridge that brought them over. She never forgot there was nothing that she wouldn't do for her mother. Next welcome, the first lady of gospel, Sister Shirley Fever. And in 1975, Shirley decided to put that love for her mother to music, recording a cover of the country classic, No Charge. By 1975, Shirley Caesar had become one of the leading voices in gospel music. But after four years of recording with Hob Records, Shirley was far from satisfied. Her ultimate goal was to take the gospel to as many people as she could. She wanted to reach the masses. And she didn't feel like that happened with Hob Records, so she opted not to sign. After leaving Hob Records in 1976, Shirley label hopped for a few years, looking for a home that would expand her brand. In 1980, she found just that, with a well-known gospel label called Word Records. Well, Word had just been purchased by ABC, and we had made a deal with A&M Records to help us get into the general market. I think that opened up a lot of doors for a lot of artists, not only Shirley, a lot of artists in the gospel community. I wanted to go where something was happening. I could have signed with other labels, but they weren't doing anything. I wanted to go with a company that I felt certain that they would really push my product. We sought to make her music a little more mainstream gospel, a little more contemporary, using strings and horns and using higher production values. Her album Rejoice won Shirley her second Grammy Award. But with that success came a sharper public spotlight on Shirley's romantic life, or lack of it. They told me life was passing me by and that uh, some of them said a lot of ugly things about me because I was single all of those years. Do you realize how many people proposed to her and you got a name and look like you're making big money? I used to kind of like her, you know? <laughs> but she was a little too holy for me at the time. Men were intimidated by how much of a boss she was, you know? And I think it was the right thing to do for her to wait until someone could be confident enough and secure enough to allow her to be who she was. I had a full life. I didn't just sit down and waste away. I knew that God had that special person in my future, and I just waited. In January of 1983, that wait came to an end. I met the greatest man in the world. Bishop Harold Ivory Williams. He came to North Carolina, to Durham, to preach. And two weeks later, he called me. He said, will you marry me? I said, boy, he works fast. <laughs> Goodness. Never kissed him. He was a very humble man. I knew that he was the man for me. And I said, yes. Just six months after they met, on June 23rd, 1983, Bishop Harold and Shirley tied the knot in her hometown of Durham, North Carolina. That wedding was a production. It was the biggest wedding that Durham had ever had. I had 25 bridesmaids, 50 junior bridesmaids. I had 106 people in my wedding. The wedding lasted four hours. You can tell that this marriage was ordained by God because they, they just looked like they was meant for each other, and they, they were. Shirley's music flourished as well. She won two more Grammys in 1984 and another the following year for her musical tribute to Martin Luther King. But while on tour in 1986, Shirley was called home urgently. We were in Dothan, Alabama, and uh, I called home, and 
they told me that Mama had had a stroke. My sister Annie and I jumped on the plane, went straight to the hospital. I can remember going into my grandmother's room, and uh, everybody was standing around the bed. A very solemn moment, very quiet. Weeks later, in November of 1986, her mother passed. I just felt like the weight of the world was on me. Um, and forgive me for tearing, but uh, it's, not, it's not easy to talk about this. But you don't get but one mother. But it was so, so, so hard. Devastated by the death of her mother in 1986, Shirley Caesar didn't get much time to grieve. Three or four days after she buried her mother, she came to the studio to do the show. And I went to her and I said, are you OK? She said, yes, I'm a professional. <laughs> and that blew me away. The word brought me through it. I was never by myself. I was never alone. He, he was with me every step of the way. 19 months ago when I, I lost my mother, I had to tell the Lord, Lord, whatever your will is, thy will be done. Shirley channeled that pain into her music, releasing an album titled Live in Chicago in 1988, with a lead song that clung to Shirley's roots titled Hold My Mule. Everybody's got to stir because John was dancing all around the church. You call him my The deacon dragon to shut him down. He jumped back. Hold My Mule is about this guy that cannot praise the Lord in this particular church. And John tells him, well, if I can't praise the Lord in your church, I'll praise him right here. And John began to talk about it. He got so happy. My God, the tomatoes were behind him. The bean plants were in front of him. He said, hold my mule. I'm going to shout right I'm going to shout and praise God right out here where I'm raising beans, greens, potatoes, whatever. She's taking you on a journey. You're enjoying the journey while you're listening to her. You're hanging on to every word. You know, at the end of the story, she breaks out in a song. <laughs> Well, again, it's, it's Shirley Caesar using what we call these type of parables to, to kind of teach a powerful lesson. That recording suit passed her very well because she's so soulful and she has such feel. Hold My Mule became a gold seller. It was number one for 52 weeks. Isn't that something? By the late 80s, Shirley's gospel career was anchored by the release of nearly 20 albums and a room full of Grammy, Dove, and Stellar Awards. And by that time, she had her sights set on a different type of accomplishment. I'd said one day, I'm going to hold an office in Durham. I'm from Durham, North Carolina. At first, I said, Mayor, I aimed for the moon, and I hit the street lights. And the street light happened to be the city council. I remember when she was running for city council, everybody just said, why? <laughs> you don't have enough on your plate already? Why? But, you know, there's nothing that she wouldn't try. We knocked on doors. We did everything, and I won. It was the first time that a pastor had ever been on the Durham City Council. And she had already been in the community. She's feeding the hungry. She's, she's providing toys and food and clothing and emergency funds. So they knew that Shirley Caesar cared. That's why they voted for her, and that's why she won. I remember Mama and the love that she gave. Kneeling by her bedside, I can still hear Mama say, Don't you let them down. 
Shirley's music career stayed blessed as well, including a 1989 album and lead single titled, I Remember Mama. We went to school with holes in our shoes. I was sitting on the floor and she was just telling us some of the stories that she went through with her mom. So I took the song, just began to rhyme it up, and I didn't want it to be a depressing song. So the Holy Spirit gave to me to say, I remember mama in a happy way. She sings it in a way as to help you. If you're feeling bad, you know, uh, she makes you feel better. By the turn of the 90s, Shirley Caesar had all but cemented her place as gospel royalty, on stage and off. She's preaching, she's a, a renowned gospel artist, she's a city councilwoman, and she carried all those roles with integrity. Bishop Williams was pastoring in Winston-Salem, so she was learning under Bishop Williams how to be a pastor. In 1990, Shirley became the lead pastor of Mount Calvary Word of Faith Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. But there were problems from the start. Well, the church was going through trying times because they, they didn't have a leader. And so when the Lord sent me there, it wasn't easy. It's never easy for a female to pass. I don't care what anybody say. You know, Shirley Caesar had to endure a lot of sexism. She's always been someone who was a leader. People didn't see that skill. They just saw she's female. And in any church where females are pastoring, you're going to have more women because the man seems to feel that you're usurping authority over me. I come tonight to tell you nothing is too hard for God. You could not look at her and just say, God doesn't call women to ministry because when you saw how she preached and the anointing that was on her life, you, you couldn't refute that God had called her. In 1996, she broke new ground, performing alongside Whitney Houston and C.C. Winans at the Grammy Awards. Please welcome to the stage the first lady of gospel music. Y'all better get ready. The audience didn't know what was coming, but we knew that Shirley was on the side waiting. She was biting at the bits. She was like, come on, come on, here, here I come. The great Shirley Caesar! I found my little legs just running across the stage to get the mic to sing Heaven. She says, anybody want to go to heaven? Everybody like, ah! Uh, every genre of music was represented in that, in that auditorium, but everybody was on their feet listening this gospel song. But soon after that, everything changed. Right around the late 90s, there was a transitional period in gospel where traditional really wasn't popping the way it used to. It was that period where they weren't showing love for traditional or quartet. So it made it hard on all of us. Some of the major chains that were carrying gospel music stopped. Kirk Franklin, God's Property, Karen Clark, they all dropped major acid bombs of, of newer urban production that we had never heard before, but it was still apparently gospel. Everybody was migrating to that at the exclusion, to some degree, of traditional gospel. Yeah! When I was receiving all of the Grammys, I didn't have a whole lot of competition. But as things began to move, then it became harder and harder for me to keep up. When her 2003 album, Shirley Caesar and Friends, sold poorly, friends say her record label lost faith. I think Shirley had lost her champions. 
at the label. And I think if the record had been done the way we initially envisioned it and not gone in and taken away all the live elements that we did and replicated with studio elements, I think it would have been received better, but that's just my opinion. Back in the early 2000s, as contemporary gospel took the spotlight from traditional artists, Shirley Caesar wasn't sure how she fit in. But then, in 2005, gospel artist Tone reached out to Shirley with an idea that would put her back in the mix. Give it up for the queen, Shirley Caesar. There's a song called, I Know the Truth, You're Telling Lies. And I said, here, Shirley, she loved it. Then she said, Tony, I want to rap. I was like, for real? And it worked. The yellow called me the mother of the rappers. <laughs> it touched a lot of young kids, so I knew that she was breaking new ground. The radio was playing it like crazy. It was a smash. As gospel began to change, I did not want to be out there stagnant. As they changed, I changed. Maybe there were those in some of the real deep churches who did not like my change, but I wanted to keep up with the times. I Know the Truth rose to number three on the charts in 2005. The following year, Shirley started her own label, then teamed with Light Records for an album of her greatest hits. For the next several years, Shirley continued to perform around the world, but offstage, her life was becoming bittersweet. My husband uh, was up in age, and uh, his health began to fail, and so we found ourselves taking him back and forth to the emergency room, and that, that was kind of hard. She would sit up all night with him sometimes when he wasn't feeling well and just hold his hand and just tell him to hold on, he could make it. On July 4th, 2014, Bishop Harold Williams passed away from heart failure at the age of 93. I miss preaching with him. I miss him teaching our Bible study. I miss him playing his piano at the house. And I could really go on and on and on. Our lives were like that. Shirley dedicated her next album, Fill This House to her late husband in June of 2016. A few weeks later, she received a pick-me-up when she was honored for her 60-year music career with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I feel as if I'm in a beautiful fairy tale. Never in my wildest imagination would I have phantomed that one day my name would be enshrined in a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. You're talking about an artist who's been in it five decades. She was definitely well-deserving of such a momentous honor. She was the fifth gospel artist, if I'm not mistaken, to receive that honor. Long overdue, a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I'm glad that she has it now, but I think she should have had a star a long time ago. And the celebration continued with an unexpected rebirth of her 1980s hit, Hold My Mule. I got beans, greens, potatoes, tomatoes, you name it! I just remember one day going on Instagram, as we all do every day, and scrolling and seeing this video of a throwback clip of Pastor Caesar singing the Holy Mule song, kind of chopped and screwed. Chris Brown was like, okay, you can play the song, You Name It, by Shirley Caesar, and you have to dance to it. You name it! Potatoes, tomatoes, leaves, greens, I was potatoes, on a cruise tomatoes, leaves, out in the middle greens, of the Caribbean. I didn't even know what viral meant. Greens, 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 potatoes, tomatoes, leaves, greens, potatoes, tomatoes, leaves, greens, potatoes, greens, 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 greens. Everyone was doing this challenge. So for the first time, you have someone who they may have never heard of. Now suddenly, young people are investigating where's the origin of this song. You name it. You name it. I feel that the reason why it came back around again, because people can relate to it, all ages, all church, 
all religions. It was great. Even Snoop Dogg hopped on the remix of the track. So it really just took off. It was a great opportunity. It was current, it was uh, relevant, but definitely exposed her to a new generation that may not have been familiar with uh, Shirley Caesar's work. Let me break it down to you. She got something like 46 grammars from the Cali to Miami. Got the game on lock. One, two, step with the clown walk. Mixed with the church close off three times. Oh, At the age that she's at now, one thing I have to say is her energy is amazing. Those of us that's gonna be in heaven, we're gonna be there because we want to be there. She still ministers with the same force that she did 30 years ago, maybe even 40 years ago. She's not one to just sit around and do nothing. She's always doing something. She's for every generation that exists and every generation that she'll come. They'll know about Shirley Caesar. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. It's a mandate on my life that I must continue on to tell this good news and to get it out there. Mama taught me how to pray. God has put that drive in me to want to do it, to want to say yes to him. I'd like to be remembered as a person who refused to give up, as a person who I'm going to keep going and we'll keep trying till I get it right. It is no secret what God can do. If he's done it for me, he can do it for anybody else. He did it for me, and I'm grateful. I'm so grateful. <laughs>